here with us today. Recording is in progress. So we have just one hour and I'm going to jump right in and make some space for you to hear about this report in all its color and depth and those involved in it and interested in it. And um, just a brief, after brief introduction from myself, we're going to come to you as the audience and get a bit participatory or as much as we can with so many people. What I'm going to ask you to do in just a few minutes is to write into the chat, what is the most important question for you arising from this report? Or what are you really curious about? Um, just one question, please, per person. Some of those questions will be put directly to the speakers, but others can also be responded to by members of the team of Changing Markets who are standing by for your questions. Um, so to start and with an introduction, just five points. What is this report about? Who has put it out there and is organizing this event? Why are they launching now? who's going to speak, and a couple of ground rules for the call. So let me make this extremely short so we can uh, get into the thick of it. So first of all, the new report is called The New Merchants of Doubt, and it's a comprehensive overview of the playbook being used by the big meat and dairy industry to distract, delay, and derail climate action. It focuses on 22 big meat and dairy corporations across seven national to regional contexts. And it's the result of a year's worth of research with 15 expert researchers and investigative journalists. Why now? So the science is clear. Methane emissions need to be cut to avoid climate tipping points. Meanwhile, animal agriculture is the single largest source of man-made methane emissions and a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. The meat and dairy industry are increasingly being compared to big oil, using some of the same tactics to distract from their responsibility in the climate crisis. In terms of who has brought this out, it's the Changing Markets Foundation who work to expose irresponsible practices and drive change towards a more sustainable economy. They partner up with lots of NGOs, foundations, research organizations, and run campaigns that aim to shift market share away from unsustainable practices, products, and companies, and towards more environmentally and socially beneficial solutions. So who is going to speak today? Well, I'm very glad to tell you, and the full bios will appear in the chat in just a moment, but we have Paul Behrens, an author and British Academy Global Professor at the University of Oxford, who has written an awful lot on climate, energy and food. Then we'll have Faustine Badefossé, who is EEB or European Environmental Bureau's Director for Nature, Health and Environment. We'll then go to Brazil to André Campos, who is a journalist and senior coordinator at the NGO Reporter Brasil. Ben Lilliston is the Director of Rural Strategies and Climate Change at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And last but certainly not least, we'll have Nusha Urbancic, who is the CEO of Changing Markets Foundation. Now, a final one before we go over to you, a couple of ground rules. In this world, uh, which is a jungle of acronyms, we'll ask you to go easy on the acronyms, both the speakers and in the chat, and please explain them where you can. Um, please speak slowly uh, to the speakers so that the audience can hear you. And to the audience, you won't be able to intervene directly, but you can ask questions. And that's what I would encourage you to do now via the chat. So again, the question is, what is the most the thing you're most curious about, what's the most important question emerging for you around this report? Please choose one question. And I'm going to do something that is rare on a webinar. I'm going to ask us to pause for 30 seconds so you can focus on that question entirely and not try to do something else. So the clock starts now and then we'll go over to our speakers. Thank you.
Okay, great. Anyone arriving in those 30 seconds will be wondering what's going on. At any rate, what I'm going to do now, um, just to say before I go over to Paul, I'll ask one kickoff question to each speaker, and then we'll come back to questions from the audience to each of the speakers. So, Paul, um, again, author uh, uh, and uh, scientist, as an academic, what is your view on the state of scientific consensus when it comes to uh, the food system transformation? Thanks so much, uh, Laura, and uh, really great to join you for this really um, important uh, webinar about this very, very important re report. Um, there is no serious scientific debate uh, about the need for dramatic reductions in livestock emissions very soon in order to meet climate targets. Um, in work that we published actually earlier this year, we asked over 200 climate and food experts, including senior academics and IPCC authors, what sort of reductions are needed uh, in order to meet 1.5 degree climate targets. And the consensus was we'd need a 50% reduction in this decade in livestock. Um, and that's a consensus across, across the board. Um, there is some debate about which country should do more and by how much. Uh, but in our study, the consensus was that in low income countries, they should cut much later than high income countries. And high income countries uh, should cut rapidly and very deeply. Uh, and of course, these are the countries that are home to many of the industries and companies that have been highlighted in the Changing Market Foundation's report, of course. So this is actually the area in which the scientific consensus suggests that we need the most reductions. Um, and this is just regarding climate change. And I think it's important to look across all of the environmental issues, water pollution, air pollution, land use, antimicrobial resistance, zoonoses, biodiversity loss, and, and, and much more. And we find a clear consensus across the literature, the scientific literature, uh, the need to reduce li livestock as the biggest single driver of most of these environmental problems. And, you know, what's interesting is, you know, if we don't do this, you know, it will re rebound on the food system in terms of crop and livestock losses uh, due to the climate change and the biodiversity loss that the, the system is driving. Um, and the Changing Markets Foundation report shows that it's, you know, not only that the industry targets are not credible, uh, that they're actually ignoring the science and in many cases actively misinforming the public and policymakers about that science and the scientific consensus. And the efforts will ultimately undermine uh, and block the, and delay uh, the very actions that we need to actually secure a sustainable food system and a safer future for the planet. Very well said, and even much before your time. Thank you for that, Paul. What, <laughs> what I'm going to do now, if you can just stand by there for a moment, as I said, we'll just start with an opener question. I'm going to go over to Faustine and I will come back to you in just a moment. So again, Faustine, the report reminds us that back in 2019, the brand new European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced Europe's man on the moon moment with an ambitious green deal. It feels like at some point that rocket went a bit off course. Now you're in the middle of these discussions right now representing EEB. How close do you think Ursula von der Leyen is to that man on the moon moment? And what's that gonna look like for this upcoming mandate? And if you can you know, add in, I know you've only got a few minutes, but what role do you see as being played now by meat and dairy companies in getting us there or, or not? Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. Happy to be here as well. I don't know if I would be as good as Paul and as short, but I will try my best. <laughs> um, yes, indeed, uh, following waves of demonstrations from the youth climate strikes around the globe and what we called also uh, the green wave in the European Parliament, Ursula von der Leyen at the time, uh, president of the European Commission, came with her uh, Green Deal, which was a plan to tackle the triple crisis that we're faced with climate biodiversity and pollution and aiming at achieving climate neutrality by 2050. Now, uh, things didn't go necessarily as they should have, as you pointed out, uh, Laura. In uh, 20, I mean, actually last year, we were reminded that we had crossed six out of nine planetary boundaries by the Stockholm Resilience Center and that our unsustainable food and sy system and uh, ultimately our agricultural production model <clears throat> was playing a great share in this sobering uh, picture. At the same moment, 
the EU own climate uh, progress uh, report show that agriculture emissions would only decrease by 1% annually with existing measures. At that moment, clearly, one of the important building block within the Green Deal, the so-called farm to fork strategy, which was aiming at having a systemic approach from production to consumption, was extremely and much needed. Unfortunately, it was at that year that we understood that it somewhat got uh, buried. And indeed, the farm to fork strategy from the beginning got lots of resistance from the uh, national level, the agriculture ministers actually rejected the idea of making the goals of the strategy linked with the agriculture um, subsidies policy, the so-called common, common agricultural policy. But also immediately after Russia invaded Ukraine, the attempts to derail the farm to fork strategy agenda intensified and the farm to fork strategy got dismantled bit by bit. And this, despite calls from hundreds of scientists uh, and experts uh, in Europe saying that farm to fork strategy was actually the way forward for this crisis, but also for any sort of future geopolitical turbulences and calling, and they were calling clearly for accelerating the shift towards healthier diets with less animal products, increasing production of legumes and further uh, greening of EU agricultural policies and reducing the amount uh, of food waste. Now, instead of fulfilling the farm to fork strategic plans, what the president of the commission did in 2023, she announced a dialogue. A dialogue to depolarize and help foster the discussion between, in particular, environmentalists and farmers. Immediately at that moment, the press reported that the farm to fork was dead and long live to the uh, strategic dialogue. What's interesting is actually the outcome of this dialogue, which are really hot from the press because they were presented, it was presented uh, last week. And as a member myself of this dialogue, I had the honor to actually be participating uh, in it. I can say a few words about that. Um, this dialogue was made of 29 members. Uh, uh, representing producers, farmers, retailers, consumers, scientists, but also environmental NGOs, animal welfare, uh, food banks, etc. The fact that actually it led to a consensus, so there was a consensus and the adoption of a 100 pages report is already quite historic and uh, unique, especially when you think that this dialogue was really felt uh, in the first place as a, a tactic, an electoral tool from the president of the commission who was running for her re-election, but also a tactic to delay important political actions. Now, what's even more uh, historic is actually what it says. Um, and what's interesting is that this consensus is neither more nor less an implicit call for the farm to fork strategy to be brought back. And why am I saying that? Very quickly, three points. Um, the report starts with an, in, an equivocal statement that business as usual is in no way an option and that time for change is now. But it goes much further and it states that average protein intake from animal sources exceed dietary guidelines in the EU, while it calls on the Euro institutions to accelerate and support the trend towards rebalancing towards plant-based options. And it has also reference to uh, production-focused measures relating to livestock. Nice. And even if it doesn't refer to reducing animal production mm -hmm. uh, per se, it does refer to the need to tackle animal production in high concentration area, notably through voluntary buyout schemes. So as I said, the fact that there is a consensus, but that it yeah. is a consensus coming from that broad range of strict stakeholders, including farmers, but also Food Drink Europe, environmentalists, etc., is yes. a big argument. Now the yes. big question is, what will Ursula von der Leyen do with it? Right. Thank you for bringing us to that. And that is pretty exciting news. Um, this did go over the three minutes, but don't worry, we'll catch up after in the second round. Um, you mentioned there, Faustine, and you've been very busy, I see, in the last weeks, um, uh, that, you know, the Farm to Fork was dismantled despite calls from hundreds of scientists. And this has been the story all the way through. And it's a nice bridge back to Paul. Paul, there is a question from a member of the audience for you, which is, you know, what is the most important or useful thing we can do as concerned scientists? Uh, well, I think um, it's concerns. We have to be sending the message that uh, food system transmit transformation is urgent. And um, 
we have to learn from the communications um, literature uh, that we need to repeat the same me messages and, and the same stories uh, regularly uh, about what the science suggests in terms of the consensus. Uh, so we need to keep discussing the fact that a food system transformation um, is necessary even beyond an energy transformation. So even if we don't, uh, even if we sort of have the entire energy system uh, transition to zero carbon, and we put in all the wind turbines and all the batteries and all the solar panels, um, that the food system on its own will push us beyond 1.5 degrees. So we have to be clear about this urgency all the time. Um, I think other roles that we can play is holding the um, industry and international bodies to account for their science that they are representing. So for example, we had issues last year with the FAO uh, Sustainable Livestock uh, Strategy, a report that they, they, they uh, released looking at the um, role that dietary uh, change can make towards reducing emissions. Uh, and we actually found many different scientific flaws in the modeling work that they did. Uh, and these were significant flaws that undermined the results. We, we estimate that they under, underestimated uh, the impact of dietary change by about six to 40 times. So really significant uh, uh, differences to the scientific consensus and the scientific literature. So then with myself and, and Matthew Hayek, uh, we wrote a, a letter to the FAO asking them to retract this report because it didn't take into account the scientific consensus. And I think it's interesting that it's the FAO that brought out this work that didn't reflect the scientific consensus. When you see uh, the WHO, uh, the World, World Health Organization, uh, UNEP, the Environmental Program, uh, both coming out, uh, talking about the need for dietary chain, talking about the need uh, for a reduction in livestock emissions. And while, and yet it's the FAO, which is, you know, partially funded and has, has um let's say, influence on its various panels uh, that is not uh, reflecting the scientific consensus. There's something, there's some big issues going on in the way in which they systemic, systemically report uh, the scientific findings. Thank you for that, Paul. And um, I wonder, Faustin, we had to almost cut you off there at the end, <laughs> brutally, um, but you were getting to the point where you were talking about Ursula von der Leyen's role in this. How, how do you see that going forward and what kind of support is she going to need to to make something happen with this consensus piece? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Indeed. Um, well, she herself committed to actually use this report for her own vision uh, within the first hundred days. So uh, she stated that again in her so-called political guidelines, you know, which she presented to the European Parliament before being uh, re-elected. So she made a commitment there. Now, of course, what we have to make sure is that she takes that as a consensus, but as a package. Mm -hmm. Not that she does, because of course, you know, I mean, I said that the report is 100 plus pages long, so uh, it has a lot of things. It's a consensus. It's a compromise among a big group of uh, uh, stakeholders, and um, it has to be understood as a package. Um, you know, on uh, animal farming, it does have a lot of things linked to technology, technological solutions like feed additives, etc. But it does say that it is not enough and that we need to have this territorial approach and voluntary buyout schemes, et cetera. So it goes one step further. And again, the fact that, you know, this has been signed by the actors, which in the first place, you know, we're not necessarily recognizing science or, you mm -hmm. know, is a very important uh, uh, step. And it's very important that uh, Ursula von der Leyen takes that as a package and that she sticks to, to her commitment. But she's not alone. And mm -hmm. it's just a commission. And then what yes. matters is that uh, the so-called co-decision makers, the European Parliament and the Council uh, of Ministers also endorse it um, and uh, turn that into uh, actual political action. And as I said, you know, in a way, this is an implicit call for um, somehow revival of the farm to fork strategy, and in particular, the sustainable food um, systems law, which was an important milestone of uh, the farm to fork strategy. Fantastic, super clear. If I may sort of add a, a sneaky follow-up question in there to you, Faustine. There is a question from the audience. Is there a credible policy blueprint or template out there that we should be supporting for the regulation of livestock emissions? 
one that is existing already that is out there. Well, I mean, there was this this farm to fork strategy, and you know, which uh, did not contain, uh, you know, it was a strategy in the first place. And then you had this uh, SFS uh, sustainable food systems law, which had been drafted, we know, but we never saw the light of the day. What we understand though is that it was not uh, strong enough on uh, consumption uh, related measures. And the good thing with our um, report, you know, within the dialogue is that. It does have uh, a request for, uh, you know, moving on that. So hopefully, you know, what's on the table can even be improved. Now, as regards the emissions and emissions from the livestock sector in particular, there is a whole discussion now around the so-called emissions uh, trading scheme, the ETS mm -hmm. led uh, by um, uh, DG Klima. But this is an ongoing uh, discussion that is uh, uh, taking place as we speak. OK, thank you for that. And if I may say to the audience that there's a fantastic table uh, from page 103 of the report that goes through the Green Deal and 10, 11 different policies, some of them mentioned there by Faustine, most notably Farm to Fork. Um, and it describes the pretty disappointing outcome on most cases and how it was derailed. Do have a look at that. But it sounds like there is at least initial good news going forward at this point in time and a long road to go. May also say that there's an acknowledgement and thank you, Paul, for your answer uh, from the audience. I just spotted in the chat and um, I'm going to go over to Brazil right now. In fact, I wish I could go over to <laughs> Brazil right now. In fact, I'm going to Andre in Brazil. Um, Andre, you're very welcome. And as I mentioned, Andre Campos is a journalist and senior coordinator at Reporter Brazil. And my question to you, Andre, so the Brazilian case really stands out for complete corporate capture of a political system by agribusiness, including cattle and dairy industry. Do you see this getting any better under the administration of Lula da Silva um, facing into a COP in the Amazon in Brazil next year? Really, how do you view Lula's commitment to this agenda? Thanks a lot, Laura. Thanks a lot for the invitation, the opportunity to discuss these important issues here. And let me say that uh, probably not the best time to come to Brazil right now, Laura. We are right. uh, in the middle of the firing seasons here in Brazil. I live in the southeast of the country, which is kind of far, far away. It's actually far away from the Amazon forest and other forest areas that we have. But if you see the sky here, it's all gray. It's if you have a parallel to imagine, it's like you're sitting in Rome or some kind of city and the sky is gray because it's fi there's fire in northern Germany. That's how hard we are facing the situation right now. But uh, anyway, just uh, answering your question, uh, I think that uh, this government has uh, reclaimed uh, 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 the, the idea of having an environmental agenda and commitments uh, uh, with... Uh, and in deforestation uh, here in Brazil, which is of course the main contribution that we have for uh, uh, climate change here. Uh, but we always have to remember that um, the Brazilian government here, Lula's government is a, a co coalition government. Uh, it, it runs a country together with uh, a bunch of uh, multiple parties, a very fragmented party, uh, political system and the parliament where these forces are represented is much much more conservative than the uh, executive power and this led us to a situation where uh, any government really in in brazil to be functional it's it has it it, it has to make compromises with these forces and agribusiness uh, the agro-industrial lobby is very overrepresented in these spaces. So uh, if you're taking uh, important uh, uh, spaces on the government, like the Ministry of Agriculture, things like that, uh, it's going to be well established that the agribusiness is going to uh, to run, you know, how things are, are done there. So any changes, any legislative changes, any public policies that are uh, created here to regulate uh, how uh, life is, 
livestock industry operates or other agribusiness uh, sectors is going to be based in uh, compromising with the sectors. It's going to be uh, uh, created around, you know, long term uh, shifts and changes in processes. And uh, so I think that the current scenario that we have, of course, is much, much better than what we have in recent past with governments that were explicitly against uh, any kind of environmental agenda. But uh, I would be very cautious to uh, on, on what we could expect in a short term and a mid term in terms of big changes and big shifts, because sadly our political scenario is such that uh, it's uh, it moves slowly uh, in the direction of uh, relevant changes when. And at the same time, that many times what we have, in fact, is the setbacks because of the lobby that's very well established. Thank you for that, Andre. And well, also thanks for starting that on a, a personal and realistic note of it not being the greatest time to come to Brazil and bringing us back to reality of the fire season, as you have said, and where that comes from. Um, so not really feeling that there's such a sense of urgency going towards the COP uh, next year. I will come back to you in just a moment, but if I may, um, I'm going to now go to Ben Lilliston, the Director of Rural Strategies and Climate Change at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Ben, I've got a difficult question for you, um, given that things are very much up in the air in the US at the moment. Um, but clearly the US is a major player in the whole story of meat, dairy and climate. So where do you see things going when it comes to potential for food system transformation, climate action and the role of meat and dairy companies in this? Yeah, it's a, it is an interesting time politically, of course, but also... Um... I think for the meat and dairy industry, I think first thing to understand, which maybe most people do, is that industry is enormously powerful, like uh, uh, along the lines of the defense industry in terms of their power. Um, they have an enormous amount of money, but they also work really hand in glove with the feed industry, which is the big grain companies, the pesticide and fertilizer industry, which is helping prop up the feed industry. Um, and then they have an, a great grassroots power. They have farmers in, you know, most states that will advocate for them and that are sort of closely tied to this system. Um, so anything that's done um, is kind of an uphill battle. But I would say um, the Biden administration, um, and that's sort of what we have, to guess about moving forward if there was a, a Harris administration has been um, very good on competition and antitrust and improving farmers' rights within uh, uh, con contractual rights and legal grievances and so forth. Um, and they also acknowledge climate change is real and they're you know, funding conservation programs and sort of smaller scale meat industry. So they're sort of a vision, slight vision for a different system of production. But what they're not doing is really taking on climate emissions. Um, they're not going to regulate the industry uh, from an emission standpoint, and they are promoting biogas, which is a um, uh, something that the natural gas industry is supporting, as well as the really big meat and dairy companies. It really only works for the largest operations here in the U.S., the way it's set up. Um, so I you know, all we can do is speculate, but I think some of that would, would continue. And those are the type of things that be debated in the farm bill right now, which is in Congress and will be moving forward. If you go to the other scenario of a Trump administration, we can go by what he did during that time. Um, and there was, you know, no regulation of the industry, no acknowledgement of climate change, huge subsidies for farmers who grow feed. So I think we can anticipate that uh, continuing and really advantaging the industry. Um, but a couple of things he did do that are kind of chaotic um, as uh, his use of tariffs and getting in trade fights really did cause problems for the industry because it is a global industry and they're thinking about export markets all the time. Um, but the other thing, uh, and I think something that the industry is concerned about is his approach on immigration and 
most meatpacking plants and, and a lot of the big dairies rely on immigrant or refugee labor and the idea that there's going to be big deportations, I think, uh, potentially under his administration and that kind of approach, hostile approach towards immigrants and refugees um, could also be disrupted to the industry. I, I think the last thing I'll raise is um, right now we're in the middle of a pretty multi-year drought in the U.S. and it is affecting the cattle herd. It is disrupting the industry. And we have the lowest um, lowest cattle herd, I think, in 60 years. And and it is expected to shrink further over the next um, four, almost five years. And so that kind of fits into this climate discussion, as well as the industry. Is this a is this a blip? Is this um, or is this a kind of permanent condition? And I think the industry is sort of grappling with that and the implications of that. Then I must admit, I didn't catch why you have the lowest cattle herd in 60 years, or is there an official theory? Oh, it's a it's a multi year drought, and right. and, and, and it's affecting the, their ability to graze, right. and um, have really good pasture, and um, and then you have a situation where uh, ranchers are getting better price because there's fewer fewer cattle on the market, so they're selling them off, mm -hmm. and so it's a it's kind of a a cycle, and and the cattle herd usually goes up and down in the U.S., so that's not it's not unusual that it's going up and down, but it is particularly down right now mm -hmm. and we can see that it's probably climate related so climate change itself is posing challenges to the livestock industry right thank you for that i think that's that rebound on the food system that paul referred to at the beginning and um, if you can hold on there for just a moment i'm also going to go over to nusha who again is the um sorry i'm going on my file is the ceo of the changing markets foundation Nusha, um, your organization has been behind this report. And one of the most interesting things in it is this use by agribusiness, dairy and meat companies of the fossil fuel industry playbook of tactics. Could you tell us a bit more about how that looks in practice? Yes, of course. Thank you so much for uh, moderating this great event and to everyone on the panel. We've seen actually how these tactics play out in different regional geographical contexts. And I want to say it's not just about the tactics, it's also about the wider narratives. Uh, so we could see the fossil fuel industry really push this narrative that they're essential to fighting poverty. And we see very similar with animal products, meat and dairy companies saying this is essential to fight world hunger and malnutrition. Also, fossil fuels have been presented as part of the solution. For example, natural gas was presented as a bridge fuel, as a critical element in the climate fight. And we see similar ideas around regenerative grazing so that you know cows could draw down a significant amount of carbon from the atmosphere um, and you know things like biogas is renewable energy even better than solar and wind according to some companies. Um, we broadly divided the tactics into three categories distract delay and derail and I don't really have time to go into all of them but I would just kind of highlight a few that especially stood out to me when we were doing this research. And distract tactics, I think what is really interesting is how the industry is using science and funding research uh, with the aim to downplay the climate impact it has. So for example, different narratives around methane emissions being part of um, biogenic methane part of being part of the natural cycle or promoting the new methane metric GWP star to kind of um, highlight that it's not about emissions as such, but about the change fluctuation in emissions. Um, and then also to promote its preferred solutions. So we've seen that in fossil fuel industry, for example, with carbon capture and storage, which kind of fits within the existing system. And, um, and when it comes to big ag, we also see a lot of emphasis on technofixes. Another interesting distract tactics that we found was targeting youth because there's a big concern about younger generations not buying or consuming so much meat and dairy products. So we see advertising campaigns, especially on social media, using celebrities, influencers, sports figures 
And interestingly, they are working with some of the same PR firms that worked for big oil. Edelman is an interesting one. They worked with Exxon and Shell to hire over 100 influencers to kind of um, highlight how the oil is you know, dedicated to sustainability. And in our report, you can see they also worked for the US campaign, Undeniably Dairy, that, whose uh, purpose was to kind of reduce interest in plant-based products, plant-based dairy especially. Um, then when it comes to delay tactics, what we see is very often the industry players ask for more science, not less, and that with the purpose to delay action. Uh, they fund research that has doubts and alternatives. Um, they commit to voluntary measures to delay regulations. Um, and again, we're very much in the space of technological optimism, right? Where we don't have to change the system. We just hope that there will be some technological innovations that will actually enable us to become more efficient and to bring down the emissions. Unfortunately, even when these techno fixes are promising, the industry mostly asks for public money to fund them and they don't really invest their own re significant resources into the transformation. Um, and the last one is derail, which actually has already been mentioned by, uh, by Ben in the US. They actually spend more, uh, Big X spends more money on lobbying than uh, Big Oil, for example. In the European Union, uh, Faustine was talking a little bit about what's happening there. Our analysis of 22 companies and industry associations that they are members of shows that they spend 11 to 14 million euros a year on lobbying. Um, and then there's also conflicts of interest, revolving doors. It's the tactics that they're using, such as intimidation, uh, fear mongering and attacking alternatives like plant-based products. Um, and this results in significant, they're very successful. They have very high level access to the key decision makers. And this results in almost complete exemptions from environmental regulation and something that academics and journalists have also called agriculture exceptionalism so that they get really like special treatment compared to other sectors of the economy. So yeah, I'll just end here. Yeah, thanks for that, Nusha. And if I can kind of go backwards then with the questions and there's one, there's there's a, a healthy old uh, set of questions coming through there in the chat. Um, this one for you, Nusha, keen to hear your view about the idea of regenerative agriculture. Specifically, I am seeing more and more companies referring to this concept, which remains poorly defined. Do you agree that there's a risk that this term gets co-opted by industry to prop up meat and dairy through a narrative that these are uh, natural? Yes, absolutely. I mean, what we've seen is that over half of companies are referring to regenerative agriculture and they're giving this much more attention than, for example, methane. Um, and they're also kind of promoting this vaguely defined term within their own annual reports, within their own solutions, um, but also at the political level, like we've discovered that they have um, an NGO that's not really an NGO, but it's more like an industry foundation with uh, representing all the CEOs of uh, big companies that we analyzed. And they had uh, a series of high level meetings with the commission officials where they were promoting regenerative ag as an alternative to what was proposed by policymakers. Um, they also have their own uh, initiative um, where they're trying to define what regenerative ag is. But uh, there are several issues with this definition because it doesn't really include the things that would have been the most meaningful, like reducing livestock numbers, reducing emissions of methane, um, and actually, yeah, making it really part of the, you know, wider transformation. It's basically their own approach that is still focused on profits and yields. And um, you, you, you can just, you know, change, tweak a few small things, and then you, you kind of count as whatever you're doing is regenerative. So I see this as a huge problem, as a huge risk, and it's something that, um, that you know, should be, um, yeah, should be carefully um, scrutinized. Thank you for that, Nusha. 
Um, ben, if I may, again, turn the wheel backwards and go back to you. So given the role you outlined on the situation in the US, how do we engage with animal protein multinational corporations to improve um, given the need for them to, in some instances, change their business portfolios? Yeah, I think that there's a real opportunity coming up, um, even though the US um, SEC rules around climate disclosure were pared down and are also facing legal challenge right now. Uh, California has put forward really strong rules on this and other states in the US are also looking to kind of follow California's lead. And so what this means is companies will have to disclose um, their climate risk and their strategy around climate change, as well as their emissions. And different different rules have different amounts of emissions. And we want, you know, full what is called scope three. So their full supply chain. But this is coming from investors and coming from consumers. And so it is a way to create more accountability to the companies. Up up to now, they've been able to say whatever they want and in their climate plans. And I think they've treated it more as a marketing opportunity rather than a real structural change in the business for portfolio. They've done a lot of greenwashing, which is really well documented in the Changing Markets uh, report. And so I think this is an opportunity. Um, these are sort of government filings, legal filings, and Europe also has um, very strong sort of climate disclosure rules coming into play. So I'm sure they'll look for ways to get around those rules but I think it's a great way to hold them accountable to making change, even as we ultimately do need to push, I think, for regulation of their emissions. And, and at least in the U.S. perspective, that needs to you know, continue. But that's a longer, you know, probably path right now. Um, and that's a good way to hold the companies accountable, I think. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, Andre, if I may come back to you, there was a question in the chat which was asking whether there are examples of litigation strategies against the meat and dairy companies for climate related damages in the report. Are there any examples of this in Brazil that you're aware of? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we, we, we do have a few examples and new situations starting to pop up uh, in that direction, both locally and also internationally. Uh, just last week, we, we we had a very, you know, uh, this is a new situation here, uh, unheard of in many ways, but uh, JBS and other uh, uh, slaughtering companies were lawsuited because uh, they were sourcing capital from the protected area. So as a, it was a supply chain issue uh, that was uh, being uh, litigated there and uh, the company was being held accountable because of its supply chain, which is always something difficult to uh, establish you know, responsibilities uh, in that kind of context. We don't know exactly where this is going to lead, what's going to, to be the final settlement of a case like this, but we are starting to see an idea of, you know, uh, having those companies uh, held accountable uh, in a broader context, not only because of their own specific uh, operations, but uh, taking into account their supply chain, which is in Brazilian case, the, uh, where most of the problems are in fact. Uh, you have to take uh, into consideration, you know, uh, the farming sector and it's most of the case independent farmers, but that are going to places and are doing things in a certain way because there is an industrial incentive for that reality to take place. And internationally, we also have some few examples uh, uh, related to this new wave of due diligence uh, legislations that we have in in Europe, uh, one of them is focused the 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 French supermarket chain Casino, which is a very important uh, uh, supermarket supermarket brand here in Brazil, and is related to the fact that they are selling meat uh, from companies with uh, associated to in environmental and social impacts in their supply chain. This is based on the French due diligence law. And there is also uh, uh, another uh, 
lawsuit that probably is going to uh, this is still being discussed. The, uh, the case was presented to the French courts, courts, but uh, we we still don't have an answer if they are going to be accepted. Accepted, but but it's focusing on how the French banks, big French banks, are uh, giving loans, supporting uh, uh, the activity activities of uh, big industrial meat companies here in Brazil, and uh, the association of these loans with uh, environmental impacts related to the activity of these companies here. So it's kind of a new path. Uh, hard to know at this point uh, what we are going to see at the end of the road as, as concrete results of this, but I can tell you for a fact that uh, certainly it shakes uh, the companies when things are led to this new level of accountability, which is the legal level of accountability. Thank you very much, Andrea. Super clear and, you know, gives us some hope uh, that things are moving forward. What I'd like to do now is also bring in the other two speakers, Paul and Faustine. Um, there is a specific question that I'd like to ask to Paul that has come through. Um, but after that, what I'm going to do is just see if anyone in the group wants to respond to any questions they see popping up in the chat, because I've been uh, <laughs> sort of working with uh, uh, colleagues from uh, from Changing Markets to, to work that out. But you might want to answer something yourself. Paul, if I may, um, there is a question here which says, I'm just curious from the panel, what role alternative proteins or novel foods might play in meeting global, growing global demand for meat whilst also reducing emissions. Is that one you'd be able to give a go at? Yeah, sure. I, I, it could, the, the role could be massive. Um, it depends on the kind of food future that you envision. You could see a future where we're looking at more whole food, plant-based sort of diets, uh, a shift towards uh, greater amounts of vegetables and uh, fruits. You can also see a role for substitutions of current uh, livestock products. And certainly there's a lot of technological and uh, venture capital interest uh, that's currently uh, being undertaken to develop these products. Um, I personally think that it'll be a mix. Um, I think that some of those products are potentially very exciting. They open opportunities for different kinds of cuisines and, and cooking and flavors and textures. And I think that's one of the, the key things that we need to remember is that, you know, even without the old proteins and even without um, the novel foods, um, you know, there is a whole world of different plants to explore out there. It's not a story of abstinence where we have to cut something out. It's a story of exploration where we can enjoy the exploration of a whole uh, swathe of different uh, products and different dishes. And I think one final thing I should just mention on that is that there's been a lot of concern about uh, processed foods and ultra processed foods. And this sounds very sort of ultra processed. Uh, but what we need to bear in mind and keep in mind is that once you isolate those processed foods and you isolate the sugar and the high animal um, uh, uh, content products, you don't see the same uh, health impacts. You don't just you don't see the same uh, impacts from plant based um, processed foods. So I think that's a really, really key one in terms of uh, the messaging, in terms of how we discuss um, uh, the health outcomes of these products. So, I mean, in short, it, it sort of depends a lot on industry. It depends a lot on the economic factors. Um, it depends on a lot on the cultural appetite, uh, but we could certainly see it helping quite substantially. Great, thanks for that, Paul. Let me also see for Faustine, was there a question that came up, Faustine, that you felt, oh, I'd love to jump in on that? Perhaps not, which is fine. <laughs> um, well, no, I just saw that there was one that was uh, addressed to the EB in particular, to me, um, as regards uh, emission uh, tax and uh, pricing uh, emissions, and I guess also in relation to um, what um, Denmark uh, did. Um, I would invite uh, the participants to have a look at uh, also the uh, we some a colleague of us uh, wrote an article about that and uh, to summarize um, it's not a silver bullet for sure especially in the case of um, of Denmark the problem is that the way it's being done uh, it will lead to only technological fixes and feed additives etc but in no way it is about reducing uh, numbers. That is clear. 
Um, in their case, it was a package also with this uh, nature restoration fund and, you know, like money going for rewetting peatlands, etc., which is very valuable and uh, very important. But it is important to look at uh, other tools, which we also discussed quite in details, of course, in the in the dialogue. Um, for now, for instance, there is a lot of uh, public money still going for marketing, uh, for promoting, let's say, or instead of not marketing, marketing private, but, you know, promoting uh, certain types of uh, products, including uh, uh, meat and, and dairy. So, you know, just stopping that uh, uh, would be uh, the first thing to do, but also also regulating uh, private marketing uh, much better than it is uh, now. But also fiscal, you know, instead of uh, taxes per se, you know, now fiscal um, incentives. We see that in some countries, um, you see that it's being used. Actually, you have um, a lower rates for uh, meat and, and dairy products in comparison with their alternatives, the plant alternatives. I mean, you would need to do it the other way around, uh, uh, obviously. Um, and of course, an important part, um, which is also in the dialogue, but that's something that we discussed a lot with the, uh, with, with the actors uh, in the group, uh, is this question of transition. Uh, because, of course, it is always used also as an argument not to move and to, you know, stay at statu quo. Of course, it will cost more to some than others, and it will be harder for some farmers that will have to leave their business potentially. But that's why, you know, we do talk about buyout schemes in the report, and we have to accompany that, tr that transition and also have reskilling uh, programs, uh, etc., in place. That's great. Thank you for that, Faustine. I, I know there was another question here about, you know, how do we bring these findings to a wider audience? And I wonder, I mean, that question I could throw out to really anyone in this group who would like to, uh, to go for that one. Nusha? Yes, I can go. Thank you. I mean, I think um, an interesting kind of um, studies that came out um, and we tried to include that in our report is also that media kind of overlooks this topic. So when they report about climate, they actually report very little about the impact that food and farming has on the climate. And they're still kind of looking very much in both sidism. So they try to present it as it used to be around climate change, someone who agrees that, you know, we need to do something and someone else who doesn't think this is the case. And I think what Paul started with is like, you know, we are in the climate emergency and the transformation of food system is also urgent. So I think, yeah, having more journalists, more media, more, um, more politicians even taking up this topic. And, you know, despite the fact that there might be a, a you know, industry funded or industry, um, uh, kind of triggered backlash, which, you know, we have seen a lot and the misleading narratives and things like that, misinformation. I think that would be, you know, a really, really important step. Um, and then I think, yeah, what is also important here is the role of philanthropy, because I think there's not a lot of funding has been going into this topic. Uh, compared to other other sectors, right, and uh, and the role of scientists, right. I think what Paul was saying earlier, we really need to speak out and you know highlight that the, there is a scientific consensus in this field, and um, and that this is something where we need to act on. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nusha, and I think that's a, a good sort of final note to to finish on from the speakers. We've just got a couple of minutes before we close. And I wanted to say that um, Changing Markets have put so much work into preparing this report, this event, bringing together the speakers. And it would be really, really nice if when you, know, you finish up with this today, you could go on social media and share this report uh, and your thinking on it. And to get to that, one other request is in summarizing or in trying to come to a conclusion on this discussion, we'd love to ask you if there's one thing you're taking away from this discussion, um, what is it? Uh, that would be really helpful if you can just post your comments in the chat. And in fact, uh, that's, that question's already come through there in the chat from Lily, thank you very much. 
So again, we'll just give maybe, you know, 30 seconds again to give people a chance uh, to sort of say what, what, what really has come out for you? What's the most important takeaway for you? And, and to the speakers, you can also feel like if you want to drop something in there, that's great. No pressure, you've been working hard. <laughs> Okay, they're starting to come in, surprised at the sheer scale of the lobbying effort from the livestock industry and its allies. Thank you for that. There is scientific consensus, food system can change. It's not a story of abstinence, but a story of exploration indeed. Uh, we're listening as a team of students and staff and are inspired to boost our efforts to bring this to the attention of colleagues around the university and beyond. Very nice, thank you. Great. And with just a few minutes, we may have more comments coming through, but I do need to play my role in terms of saying a massive thank you to Andre, Ben, Paul, Faustine, Nusha, and all the team from Changing Markets for all the time you've put in and for getting up very early in some parts of the world and for tolerating Anglophones <laughs> to the non-Anglophones, which we don't say enough on these things, but it really is appreciated. Um, and a thank you to all of you in the audience who came along and participated via the chat. I hope we got to answer a good lot of your questions. And let me just in our last minute see, is there any more coming through? Um, I'm not going to mention the applause to me that I've just seen. Thank you so much for this. You are all brilliant at what you do. And thank you for sharing the science. Great to learn more about the push for higher CA's push for higher industry accountability and take out from a great report. Don't feel that psychology of these problems have been covered enough. Ultimately, it's a psychological problem, not a technical one. Acknowledgement that food system change is not an option anymore. It's an absolute necessity. And a final one, you can read the new report, Merchants of Doubt over here on Changing Markets website. Thanks so much, everyone. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure. And at one minute before, the clock <laughs> strikes, we are finished. Thank you. And until the next one with Changing Markets and others.